Good evening, everyone. My name is Mark Berry. I'm the president of Skudik Institute at Acadia National Park, and it's my pleasure to welcome you this evening and to introduce our speakers. And before I do that, I want to briefly mention Skudik Institute, who we are and what we do, although I think we'll probably come up a little bit later in the conversation as well. So we're a nonprofit partner to the National Park Service here at Acadia. We are focused on advancing ecosystem science and learning for all ages, and often working at the intersection between those two. So engaging the public in science, connecting the learning with the research to benefit both, and connecting science to conservation, again, at the intersection of science and learning. And we have a wide range of programs and opportunities for people to participate, ranging from a free public evening lecture like this to week-long or longer immersive experiences or ongoing volunteer experiences. And we have a number of our volunteers here with us tonight, so a special thanks to them. And I want to mention just a couple of things that are coming up real soon. Uh, we have an artist reception here coming up on July 12th. And we have a celebration event in Bar Harbor on July 15th. And I want to talk about what we're celebrating, which is a new partnership that was announced just this Saturday called Second Century Stewardship, which is a partnership between the Skudik Institute, the National Park Service, and the American Association for the Advancement of Science, or AAAS, and other institutions. One of the things that's exciting about it for us is it's a national scientific organization choosing to launch a partnership with the National Park Service by partnering with us here at Acadia with the goals of expanding and improving scientific research and integrating that effort with education and with science communication. It's going to start by funding a stronger and larger research fellowship program here and build from that to new education opportunities, new science communication opportunities. And it's really just getting underway, launched with a new film by David Shaw, who's funding the initial effort. We're gonna celebrate all of that on July 15th uh, at the Bar Harbor Club, a free public event at 5.30. And special guests will be David Shaw, along with Dr. Sylvia Earle, who's uh, probably one of the most famous oceanographers and marine biologists, and marine explorers uh, there is. She's a National Geographic explorer in residence and has an incredibly long list of other awards and uh, honors that she's earned and received. And so that should be a lot of fun, very interesting. Hope you might join us for that. And then just two days later, on Sunday evening the 17th, we have a centennial Shore Seabird and Whale Watch Cruise, which is a partnership with Maine Coast Heritage Trust this year and is uh, being offered to us by the Bar Harbor Whale Watch Company. That should be a lot of fun. Not free. Uh, for both of those events, uh, really encourage you to RSVP or register in advance as uh, space will be limited. So I'll stop there and introduce our speakers. Uh, we often bring in speakers from outside, and it's actually great that tonight we have some of our closest partners speaking for us, and not only speaking, but giving us an opportunity for a discussion. So uh, Rebecca Cole-Will is the Chief of Resource Management for Acadia National Park, and Abe Miller-Rushing is the Science Coordinator for Acadia National Park. They work incredibly closely together and incredibly closely with all of our Skudik Institute staff and are really central to our partnership with the park and what makes this work as a research learning center and what makes this partnership valuable for the Park Service and for Acadia's future, which they will talk to us about now. So their title tonight is Protecting Acadia National Park, Reflecting on the Past, and Preparing for the Future. And so with that, uh, Becky and Abe. Thanks a bunch, Mark. Awesome. Becky and I were just talking, actually, neither one of us outside of the science symposium, so we have an annual meeting for folks that are doing research in the park. Outside, the last time either one of us had uh, given a talk here, a public talk here, I think it was maybe six years ago, um, so it's been a little while. Um, 
But today we're actually going to be celebrating or talking about Acadia, the protecting Acadia National Park. And the idea is because this is our centennial, this is a great opportunity for us to look back and talk about the, the future. And um, one of the really nice things about this year is that science, after having been not a really big part of the way Acadia told its story over the past hundred years, um, is science is really regaining its place. Uh, well, I guess, so probably, probably science was a big deal about 90 years ago in terms of telling the story of Acadia, but it hasn't been a big deal for a long time. Um, I'm gonna, so this is just to walk you through a little bit of an outline of our talk. Um, we're gonna talk about the origins of national park, change, and then overcoming this challenge, and actually, as appropriate, I have these three sections, um, and then Becky gets one at the end. But we're, we really are splitting this in half. Um, so these are three, we're gonna, I'm gonna tell these stories through three individuals, um, uh, which is a little bit different for me. So uh, you're gonna have to bear with me and hopefully it makes sense. Um, but we'll go through three stories as we tell, as I tell the three individuals, as I tell the story of the history of the park. And then Becky's gonna go from here on out to the next hundred years. And so to start with, I wanted to just at least give a head nod to the fact that there's a lot of history before where I'm going to start the story. So hundreds of millions of years of history. So Mount Desert Island was a volcano about a mile high 300 million years ago or so. And then after lots and lots of erosions, lots of coming and going of grilled glaciers, the Wabanaki people came. And so it has been settled by people, what, 10,000 years or 7,000 years, somewhere in that ballpark. There have been people around. And so I just want to acknowledge that history exists. And then I'm going to start my part of the story um, in 1880 with Charles Eliot. So he'll be the first individual I'll talk about in terms of the origin of the park. So Charles Eliot was an undergraduate at Harvard University. And he, his family had been coming up to Acadia National Park. And this particular summer, he wanted to bring some of his buds. His family wasn't coming. And so he asked his dad, and his dad said, yeah, you can take the boat, and you can take the camping gear, but you got to do something useful when you get there. His dad happened to be president of Harvard University at the time. Um, and, uh, and so Charles said, that sounds great, and he brought 11 of his best buds. And what they ended up doing was setting themselves up into different departments. So they had a, a bot botanical department, an ichthyological department, an ornithological. And so what they did when they got here, they set up camp. This is their camp in Northeast Harbor. Um, and they set up camp and started exploring the island, um, documenting the flora, documenting the birds, documenting the geology of the place. And it didn't take them very long to really dis identify how um, valuable the place was, how beautiful it was. Um, they recorded their notes quite diligently in notebooks like this. This is actually one of their notebooks. They were very proud of their flag. These, are, um, these notebooks are actually still held at the Mount Desert Island uh, Historical Society, and they have a nice exhibit of them, and I think the Door Museum at College of the Atlantic has an exhibit related to this group. But they identified how valuable the place was, how beautiful it was, how valuable it was to science, and, um, and how important it was to protect it. And so they kept coming back year after year um, for a handful of years and continued documenting. In fact, they got it. They documented a full floor. They documented a whole lot of the, a whole lot of the um, resources that were here. And then after that, they went on to have their lives. Charles Eliot went on to a career as a landscape architect, actually worked with Frederick Law Olmsted. Um, many of you may be familiar with him. He's probably if possibly the most famous American landscape architect. And Charles actually had a really big hand in designing the emerald necklace in Boston, so the Arnold Arboretum and the Franklin Park and, and a lot of the green areas in Boston. Unfortunately, he died quite young. He died at age 37 of spinal meningitis. And when he died, his dad, who was distraught at the time, went through his old notebooks and remembered exactly how valuable Charles Eliot thought recognized, um, and this Champlain Society crew, recognized that Mount Desert Island was. And so he set himself to making that vision uh, of protecting this land a reality. And so he worked with George Doerr and later on 
with John D. Rockefeller Jr. and ended up creating a national park. So for those of you who are budding citizen scientists or longtime citizen scientists or because these guys, the Champlain Society, I think of as citizen scientists or, but anyhow, there's something to aspire to, to do science so valuable and to motivate people to create, create a place. So this is actually a case where citizen science kind of was responsible for creating Acadia or at least inspiring it. And, and at that time, um, and for the first long period of the National Park Service's history, we managed parks as vignettes of primitive America, right? So this means we wanted to manage it as it was pre-European. And so this is how Acadia was managed for a long time, to the degree it was managed at all. Um, and so Acadia was an incredible place, worth preserving as it was, and keeping as it was. And now I'm going to move on to the next story about change in Acadia and Glenn Middlehauser. And so in 1988, Glenn Middlehauser, who several of you know, was an undergra undergraduate at College of the Atlantic. And he had quite a passion for natural history. He really wanted, he loved going out, documenting plants, uh, particularly plants, and he, uh, with his mentor at, at College of the Atlantic, Craig Green at the time. And so it didn't escape the parks. Uh, the park quickly noticed also the, this talent he had, and so we hired him in his summers a couple of times and had him do things like help us lead an inventory of our islands, um, a project that Nick Fisichelli in the audience is thinking about picking up to resurvey. But, but so he, we stuck him on a lot of tasks, but his passion was really documenting the flora of Acadia. And so he stuck with that passion, um, and but it took a long time to do. So he ended up going to grad school, starting his own business, having a family, um, uh, buying a house, moving off the grid. He actually, he went through some personal illnesses himself and, and also the early untimely death of, of his mentor, Craig Green. Um, but eventually he did finish this flora in 2005, I believe. He published it in Rodora, he and his co-authors. Um, and then they later published this field guide, which I highly recommend. Uh, but one of the really surprising things they did is, so this was a repeat of things that Charles Elliott and that Champlain Society crew had done. But what they found is that one out of every five of the plant species that the Champlain Society crew found was gone from Acadia. So no longer occurred. And not only does it not occur in Acadia anymore, but it's not random. So groups like the orchids and the asters disappeared kind of disproportionately to the other groups of the, in the park. So we were doing a bad job at managing Acadia to not change, to stay as it was, to be maintained as a pr vignette of primitive America. Glenn later has gone on to study things like birds and declines and changes in the bird populations around. And we now have scientists in all kinds of disciplines documenting the changes that are happening. Changes in the water chemistry and biogeochemistry changes in our insect communities through the bio blitzes that happen here every year, changes in our water chemistry. It turns out the park is changing a whole heck of a lot. And, and just to walk you through some of the more dramatic ways to think about this change, the warming expected over the next, um, by 2080s or so, is about the same magnitude as the amount of warming that happened since there was about a mile of ice on this spot. So even though it doesn't necessarily sound a lot, four and a half to 10 degrees Fahrenheit change, um, it has big effects. So that was enough to change from a mile of ice where we're standing to what we have now. Um, extreme rainfall events that used to occur every 50 years now occur every 12 years. So the, so the extreme is now the norm. Um, the ocean is acidifying more rapidly. The pH is getting more acidic more rapidly than it has at any time in the past 300 million years. And that's a really bad thing if you have a shell or a bone and you live in the ocean, or you're something that relies on something with a shell or a bone for like food or something like that. Um, so it's bad for a lot of our marine critters. And then climate change is also helping non-native and invasive species move in. So things like this purple loosestrife, which I'll come back to, not the monarch, we like monarch, purple loosestrife, less so. Um, and, uh, and things like uh, black-legged ticks, which carry Lyme disease, uh, are moving in as a part of, as a result of the warming. 
what's happening. So our ecosystems have really changed. Even though the postcards of Acadia don't look very different, you still see the same cliff faces, you still see the trees, it still looks green. You can't necessarily, to the untrained eye, until you start poking around, you don't notice these changes, but they're, they're dramatic. And so we have to respond, and how? And this will bring me to the last story that I'm going to tell um, about overcoming this challenge, and Judy Hayes and Connery. Um, and so this is a picture of Judy um, when she uh, was hired in the park. She started working in 1986, about the same time that Glenn was doing his thing at uh, College of the Atlantic. And when she first got here, a grad student had just done a project, invasive species, we were just starting to understand about invasive species. So species from other places that come and displace, they do really well and they start displacing our native species. And so this grad student had done a survey and said, oh, purple loosestrife looks like it's a problem. Uh, but it doesn't look like it's too bad. It looks like one year of work ought to be able to do this, ought to be able to solve this problem. And so Judy, lucky Judy, got set upon solving this problem. So she, was, she got the job of spending her one year to manage these purple loosestrife. But it turns out that the more she looked, the more purple loosestrife there was around. And what looked like initially it was a one-year problem, it just, she kept, she managed it, and it just kept turning into a bigger and bigger problem. So it was, it was a bigger problem. So she kept, kept going. What was an ant problem? Initially sounded, it seemed like an ant problem, ended up, as Judy said, an armadillo problem. I don't know if that would have been the animal that I had chose, but that's the animal that she chose. Kind of a mid-sized animal. Um, and, and so the problem was big enough that we ended up taking aggressive management. So Judy, so we needed to use herbicides because it was the only real way to manage these plants. This actually got pushback from the community when it went public that we were using herbicides. But Judy had her science behind her as she was doing this, that this is actually just an application, is a drip application or gloves, so you're just applying it to the individual plant. And they did monitoring to look at other plants if they were being affected. Um, but this was really the only way to really kill the purple loosestrife and knock it back. And so it worked. So they were really knocking back the purple loosestrife. But holy cow, if there were more invasive species kicking around. And so she realized that purple loosestrife wasn't even necessarily the worst problem. We had, we had um, garlic mustard. We had oriental bittersweet. We had glossy buckthorn, Japanese barberry. I think they've identified something like 10 or 12 really priority invasive species that they've been working on. And so the problem just kept getting bigger and bigger. At this point, it was an elephant-sized problem. And at the same time, the park was going through lots of other issues. Peregrine falcons were having problems with DDT. So we were part of a restoration project with peregrine falcons. Um, we were trying to monitor mercury pollution problems and, and acid rain pollution problems that were coming in through the air deposition and, and rain. And then we were managing declines in our fish populations because of overfishing and also barriers to, to, um, for fish that are migrating, go from freshwater to saltwater and back and forth, um, like brook trout. And so the question came up, should we give up on the invasive species problem? Um, oh, and I, I failed to mention that invasive species, well, I did mention it before. Invasive species are here. We didn't know it at the time. But in large part, climate change is, is helping a lot of these guys get here. Um, but so should we give up? And it turned out that Judy had been keeping track of what, how many plants were here and so, and so had documented the success of her program. This is purple loosestrife. This is the number of stems. These are on permanent transects that she had. And so the number of stems with flowering and, and on seedlings. And the bottom line is there were a lot fewer of them. And so it looked like we were actually succeeding. And so instead of giving up, the idea was to, to double down and say, let's invest even more in the invasive species management. Um, and so we actually went out. We got wetland mitigation money, which ended up giving us, allowing us to hire a crew of five people during each season to be able to manage and remo remove invasive species. And just to put that in perspective, when Judy got hired in 1986, that was, that was the size of the whole division of resource management, with five people. Um, and so now we had that many people just managing just invasive species. And it turned out that we really have 
Um, we're actually, it's, it's one of the biggest success stories in terms of remove, managing invasive species east of the Mississippi and possibly in the whole country. Um, in terms of, uh, we're, turn, we're just making the transition from this kind of attack of removing all of these invasive species to uh, starting to just manage as new populations pop up and just manage them. So it's a more of a maintenance thing. So this is really a national success story. But a problem is, is that as we were doing such a good job managing invasive plant species, turns out that an invasive insect pest um, snuck in. And so these are red, you can see some of these dead trees here. These are red pines. And so we got an invasion of red pine scale, and we didn't know that. Uh, it wasn't even really on our radar. But now we're losing most of the red pines in the park, just in the past couple of years. So it, We've come to realize, so this is pictures of red pine scale, um, kind of these little scale insects um, from Asia. And what we've realized is that we can't preserve uh, Acadia as a vignette of primitive America. And we can't, uh, we have to manage the change. We can't stop things from changing. Um, even in our big success stories, we, we realize we can't, um, we can't really stop things from and so we really have to uh, change our perspective. And that's where Becky is going to pick up and talk about how we are changing our perspective and where we're going to go from here, how we manage this. It's not totally depressing, I promise. OK. Well, all is not lost, although it doesn't seem like it's always going to be a good news. Um, but the Park Service has recognized that this and is recognizing it. Um, in 2010, the director really of the Park Service sort of gave us a call to, to arms, to action, that we will, we recognize climate change is here. It's a fundamental existential threat to what, what parks are, that long history of protecting these places as they were, untouched and unchanged. And what are we going to do about that? Well, here at Acadia, we've taken that, um, that idea of, of that change is. Change is happening rapidly. It's complex. And it's not necessarily anything that you can predict, obviously. And we are looking at how can we change the way we think about how do we adapt our planning and our work to address these fundamental issues. And the way we're looking at that is to really take a, a systems approach. We will plan. We will look at, do work, and we'll take a look at how effective that was. And then we will continue that, that uh, work in a, in, in a systematic way. And what is also profoundly, not necessarily different, but critically more important to us every day is the recognition that we are in this on our, alone that we're part of networks of conserved areas, of partners who can help us, and partners who can leverage and bring resources to what we need to do. So as I said, we are working through a, a planning process to understand what, what are our resources that are the most critical and the most vulnerable? What are the threats to them and then what should we be doing about that? So we have been doing a, a great deal of planning work using a, a, a process called the Open Standards for Conservation. It's widely used by conservation agencies worldwide to bring together resource managers, scientists, partners, stakeholders, um, community people to understand what, what are we looking at? What are the complexities of the systems that we're managing? And what are the choices that we should be making in terms of adaptation, if you will? We identified key, uh, key conservation targets at Acadia. None of them are likely to, su to surprise you. Things like making sure that we have our surface waters are clean and healthy, that our forests are the same, the intertidal zone is, and you, just driving here tonight, you'll understand why that's such a key uh, resource here at Acadia, both for the, re, the natural resources that are there, but that is part of the fundamental reason that Acadia came to be as both a, a iconic place for visitors and the views 
and the resources that the intertidal zone protects for us. We identified numerous threats. Abe has identified, talked about to you about some of them, invasive plants, invasive animals, um, you know, rapid uh, and complex changes in weather patterns, temperature, humidity. But some of the things that we know that, we, that are in the park that we can do something about are things, for example, like dams and physical barriers that, that are uh, blocking the migration of key species in and out of park water bodies. So how do we, how do we think about, or how can we do work related to these? Well, we identified these planning solutions, and this is a one related to um, the, uh, the connections between these barriers and what, what we should do about them, particularly in the park and in, and in surrounding areas. We're working with partners on all of this planning, and the Scudic Institute here is a, is a, a key example of bringing to bear resources of scientists community members and others who can help us identify what are the resources, what is the science that we need, and what, what should we be doing to work towards solutions. So I thought, since Abe gave you examples of some of the scientists or the stories of people who have worked in Acadia, I would bring you my own example of that. And that's Abe, as you all know, is a, one of those key people who are identifying and understanding what are some of these issues that we're dealing with. As you probably know, Abe is a leader in, internationally in, in um, um, leveraging the roles of citizen scientists in, in working in places like national parks and other conserved areas. We are doing. We are uh, addressing issues in real time now managing for uh, adaptive changes that will, will, be, um, will improve conditions, resiliency in, for ecosystems, a historical integrity of our cultural landscapes, um, and, and then taking a look at how effective our work is. For example, going back to the idea that we need to remove these barriers, we have uh, done inventories of something like 800 culverts underneath all of the roads in the Acadia National Park. Those culverts have been evaluated for their, um, the, the, whether they uh, block stream flow and passages, and where we can and when we can, we are removing those and replacing them with stream smart crossings that are improving um, stream flow in, in many of the uh, streams in the park, for example. So we are, uh, we are adapting. We're adapting and changing in the way we think about how we manage. That's in the management approach. We're inventorying all of our high-risk resources and prioritizing, implementing, and monitoring activity using sound science. Uh, we're using scenario planning, which is an approach to understanding what are some of the uh, uh, potential futures and impacts. And then we're integrating all of this understanding towards facilities management and response, like removing and changing out culverts, like understanding what are the vulnerabilities of some of our coastal uh, structures, things like Thunder Hole, things like even the Scudic Loop Road, in terms of understanding what are potential impacts in the future and what we should be doing for planning now, thinking about this next 100 years. We are using an approach of, to mitigate some of the known uh, potential impacts. Uh, and for example, this year, there is a team from uh, Worcester Polytechnic Institute of young scientists and engineers who are doing a, a, a carbon footprint assessment in the park, understand what, is our, what, what are the uh, impacts that the park alone is creating in terms of, of uh, 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 impacts to, to <laughs> emissions. Thank you, Abe. <laughs> and we're integrating this mitigation approach into our planning. You may have heard um, that the park is involved in starting a major transportation planning effort 
which will uh, result in a plan probably by 2018. As part of that planning effort, we're trying to understand the, um, the numbers of, of visitors, how visitors are using the park, um, where they're going, how we can mitigate and, and alter the impacts from too many vehicles and congestion throughout the park. As part of that planning, we will we'll involve looking at um, carbon sequestration, ways that we can reduce um, all of the energy uses in the park and, and to help improve this process. And we're communicating a, a critical piece of not only understanding what's going on in the park, how to manage that, how to work with partners is to communicate what is going on, what we understand to be cases, communicate what the, the resource issues are, and how uh, stakeholders and partners can help us with um, the, the needs that we have. Um, the, a big and huge piece of this is that change is happening, it's happening rapidly and it's very complex, but it's very uncertain. So how do you think about making changes, thinking about what you should be doing if you really don't know what's going to happen? You could simply say, oh my gosh, we can't do anything, we just have to keep doing things the way we always have because we don't know what's going to happen. That's not, um, that's not going to be a useful approach for the future, is it? So what we are trying to do is to uh, understand, think about those, those issues in the future and start managing towards um, a new approach to resource stewardship, which really does take into account how we might preserve and improve ecological and historical integrity and provide for visitors those transformative experiences that really are what parks are all about. So some of the ways we're doing that is to think about what do we do about this notion of to preserve unimpaired? That is part of the, uh, um, the mission. The Org Organic Act of the Park Service says that we will preserve the resources of the parks unimpaired. But how can we do that when everything is changing? And that's a fundamental question of not only just philosophy, but practical management application. So we're doing some things that are uh, understanding what are the vulnerable resources that we have, prioritizing some of them, and we're making decisions. We are making decisions in real time about some resources that we may have to let go, uh, some coastal resources that we cannot continue to protect. Uh, we may document them. We may acknowledge that we will lose them, but we will make decisions that are really based on sound science, and very good um, bringing in the technical expertise that, that, so that when we do make decisions, we're basing them on sound science and clear management objectives for the future. So one of the way, ways that we are uh, tackling this problem, and we've done this here at, uh, at Acadia, is to use a process called scenario planning, which is a, 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 the idea that under situations of rapid change where everything is complex and, uh, and uncertain, you, you think through and describe some ranges of plausible futures that could help us make those management decisions. So, for example, these are not forecasts. We won't, can't say by 2050, this is what it's going to look like exactly. But we can um, identify ranges of of potential changes and work towards understanding how we might manage for those. So what we did here was work, and Nick was one of the leaders of this workshop that we spent, we spent a, a nearly a week bringing in planners, scientists, climatologists, um, resource managers at the park, the, the leaders of the park, and worked through some, some ideas of what might the future of Acadia look like in real time and how might that affect decisions we make related to, for example, coastal infrastructure? How do we staff a park where we no longer have 
clear seasons. We don't have a summer season and a winter season. We are having, we're seeing more and more visitors in all of our sh shoulder seasons, and we're still relying on using a seasonal workforce to try to manage and address that. So how do we do that? How do we think about the changes that are going to happen and are happening with some of our natural resource areas, like the subalpine communities at the top of Cadillac, under different potential futures? Work through, discuss that, think about that. It gives us the, the tools and, and some of the resources to be able to make sound management decisions, again, as I said, based on good science. We're going back to this planning process over and over again in a very iterative way. What's going on? What have we tried? What is, what is working? How do we evaluate what we are doing under change? Simply, in this case, for example, before and after work, um, and we are always thinking about adaptation so that we're understanding that um, that uh, we, we, we do have opportunities to make good changes. We are uh, doing an inventories of our coastal infrastructure. We have a lot of it at Acadia, a lot of paved roads, a lot of, of, as I said, culverts. We have a lot of buildings. How should we be thinking about how best to manage those um, under different scenarios of what the future might look like and make good decisions? So, and, and as I said, we're learning as we go, um, communicating what, what, what we, we are learning and asking for help from, from scientists and others who can help us with this work. Science is all about research, collaborating, learning, adapting, and applying. And uh, as I said, the work that's happening here at the Scudic Institute, the new partnership with the AAAS and the Park Service and, and here, are, is a wonderful model of how we can uh, tackle these problems and work together. We are assessing and evaluating activities and outcomes. That's the learning part. And to, to and developing some key metrics. What, what would success look, look like if we did certain things? A well thought out plan, streams that are, do not block passage of animal migration, for example, clean water, sustainable facilities, for example, and communities who understand and support what we're trying to do. Because, after all, we don't know a hundred years from now who will be standing here, if anyone, talking about national parks. But that's sort of the, the, the ultimate goal, isn't it? That we can look back a hundred years and we can look forward a hundred years and know that we are creating a, a, an inspired cohort of new stewards who will carry forward and manage parks like Acadia for, that, for the next century. Thank you. Do I have to leave that on for questions? We'll take questions. Ask a good question, Abe. No. What do we do? <laughs> and for the questions, I'd like to run a mic to you. Uh, it helps folks that may be harder of hearing or those that aren't in the room and catch this conversation later. So if you can be a little patient, I will get a mic to anyone that has a hand up. <laughs> I'll, I'll start. Um, you alluded to the new partnership with AAAS and the grant money that will be coming in the Scudic Institute. How do you envision uh, the impact of that new science in your planning? I know it's early in the game. You have just received the news of that award, but can you give us some hints as to where you might be going in your thinking on that, either you or A? Well, either one of us or Mark certainly could as well. Um, again, uh, what an extraordinary opportunity. And it, several things about that. One, it is, is it is a true partnership. So much, much of the activity and, 
and the work will reside here with scientists who will be coming on for the fellowships. Um, what I think what we, we're seeing from this is the opportunity that uh, the, the resource needs, the questions that we need answered to help us make sound decisions as managers and scientists in the park are, are going to be addressed as part of this, this ongoing um, partnership. And so it really will leverage great opportunity for us to both communicate out what we need, but to be able to work with key partners to, who, are, who are willing and, and able to help us with them. Yeah, and I'll just echo that. Um, <clears throat> two points that I think are really valuable. One is, is through the partnership with AAAS in particular, we'll be able to, and it, the fellowship program is targeted specifically to help recruit new long-term researchers to, to set up their research, long-term research projects here. And so we should be able to get, we hope to be able to get a really talented new cohort of scientists. We've had some scientists that are retiring right now that have long time done research in Acadia, and, and so this will hopefully help us recruit a new cohort. Another thing is that that partnership is, a big part of it is, um, is around communication. And it turns out that it's actually relatively, relatively speaking, it's, it's easier to get the good science done than it is to translate that good science to the public or to managers. Um, and so having that built right into the partnership, that a huge chunk of the resources are going to, um, going to that communication part will, should really help add value to all the new research that's going to be happening from it. And when you do get this mic, hold it pretty close to your mouth. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, <clears throat> The parks um, obviously are trying to pay attention to these issues and uh, to be able to respond to them appropriately. But the um, I, I, <clears throat> Acadia happens to be on an island, but most of the parks uh, are not on islands and therefore are related. And I mean, that's not even a good analogy because all parks have um, are part of a larger world. So how is the work that you're doing being translated into what happens, say, on the rest of the main coast. Um, can you speak to that a little bit? You said some public education and so forth. You can talk about Darren sure. and some of the other partners, certainly. <clears throat> so uh, it just so happens we had a meeting just yesterday. Uh, it was just yesterday, wasn't it? Two days ago? Two days ago. <laughs> <laughs> it's summertime. <laughs> uh, so just uh, two days ago, we had a meeting of the Down East Research and Education Network, uh, which is a collaboration of land trusts and universities, College of the Atlantic, um, Maine Coast Heritage Trust. Um, so, so different organizations looking at this large landscape conservation issue, because we definitely recognize that preserving the resources in Acadia, we're totally reliant. And like, there's almost no organism that only exists within the confines of Acadia's boundaries. And so we really have to uh, be thinking about management beyond the boundaries, and also communication beyond the boundaries. Uh, so, so certainly we work, we have worked with partners and we're trying to strengthen the work with partners that work beyond the boundaries of Acadia. Does that make sense? Does that kind of answer? But, and we're certainly also working through the National Park Network broadly. So, so some of the science that's going on here and the techniques that we're developing here are being used in national parks throughout the country um, and beyond in, con in protected area for conservation throughout the country. So is this, is, is this looked upon as a laboratory? Absolutely, yes, exactly. So, so an example of that is that there, like an example we use a lot is, is a, there was a mercury. So this is one of the places in the country that's had the most research done on terms of looking at mercury pollution and how it accumulates and, and harms wildlife. Um, and so a project that was started here uh, looking, using dragonfly larvae as an indicator of mercury concentrations that bioaccumulate from the sediments into the dragonflies and up into the fish and into the birds, um, was started here and is now happening in 50 different national parks throughout the country. Um, some of the work that's gone on through mercury pollution or mercury research here has influenced EPA standards for mercury emissions from coal-fired power plants. 
And so in that way, the science that's happening here definitely has impacts further away from here. So as we're talking about citizen science, um, I'm thinking about the future and all of the future scientists that we need to cultivate. And is part of the planning really getting into the schools and or encouraging young future scientists to explore and help with data collection, <coughs> analyzation, that whole business, you know, introducing them to that whole process of science and what it's all about here where they live. Kate, would you like to answer that? <laughs> I'm, I'm looking to you guys to answer Well, she's going to say. Uh, a, a couple of things. In, in this new partnership with AAAS and the Scudic Institute is, is going to take that head on. You know, as Abe mentioned, science literacy and how do you teach what David Shaw called the, the beautiful thing that is the scientific method. How do, how, do you, how do you teach that? How do you, you know, create that next generation of those stewards? Well, uh, uh, this is, is one way that that will happen. And the other way is places like national parks. National parks get over 300 million visitors a year. As somebody said, who was it the other day that said, we're more po popular than the NFL. So there is an incredible uh, opportunity there. And that, that you know, the, the, the the next, the, to inspire the, the next century, that really is those, those fighting words for the Park Service. There really is the notion that, that we need to, to, to make sure that those transformative experiences that kids and others get happen in national parks because, we, you know, you just, the stage is set and there are great opportunities there to be able to, to, uh, to, to fascinate and inspire and and promote scientific literacy, and uh, and it's happening. It's happening right here. And and I'll just add that I, you know one of the things that's really exciting for me is at this point we're actually at the point where a lot of the citizen science that our school programs are doing, uh, whether it's with the Scudic Education Adventure with the intertidal monitoring or the um, some of the phenology or bio blitz or biodiversity discovery monitoring that are going on. Uh, they're directly connected now. We're getting them more and more closely, tightly connected with the science that we're using with resource management and the data that our scientists are analyzing. And so I think that that's, um, that's a huge step. So it's, the science is getting more and more authentic. And, and that's really valuable for us in terms of being able to use those data, but also I think to give the, the students experiences and, and the real true sense that they're contributing in a, in a meaningful way. So you are promoting with the new grant and other monies that may be coming in because of the new grant, actually targeted programs for students of all the younger years, meaning high school on down, to get involved yeah, so I, I don't, I think that would pivot back to Mark in terms of where the education dollars are going for that. Sure, so the new partnership in general is going to have four components. One is the research component through a research fellowship program. The other three are an education component, a science communication component, and an effort to convene thought leaders on important and related issues. And the education component specifically is focused on connections with classrooms and formal education, and primarily the age range you just talked about, K to 12. And there will be several areas that we'll figure out exactly how we make this work, but one way will be connecting the researchers with teachers so that teachers have real experiences working with researchers and vice versa. Another way will be developing materials for educators to use, whether that is for field experiences here in the park or in students' own communities, 
or whether that is classroom materials and curriculum. So there are several different components. We have a lot of work to do to implement this partnership, and we're just at the beginning. On the million dollars, is that staying strictly around Acadia, or is that? <laughs> so uh, the million dollar commitment is over four years, and it is shared among the partners. So it is all for work based in and based from Acadia, but it is shared among the AAAS, Skudik Institute, and the Park Service here at Acadia. It's not other national parks. It's not other national parks with this initial funding, but the ambition of this program is for the work that's done here <coughs> to be informative and to serve as a pilot and to help secure additional funding to bring this model to other parks. What infrastructures are you most worried about with the climate change? <laughs> That's a good question. You, you drove it to get here. That's one of them. <laughs> yeah. yeah. We're, you know, Acadia has um, 26 miles of the, uh, of the historic motor road. We have over 100 miles of historic hiking trails and 56 miles of carriage roads. So the park has all of this, this infrastructure in terms of the transportation system that are, are the fundamental, one of the fundamental resources of the park, but also contribute to the fragmentation of the habitats, for which we're also trying to m manage and maintain. So we have this balancing act between natural and cultural resources and, 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 and how we manage for, for the, each of those. But, um, you know, we're looking at um, the f future scenarios for, for storms, um, and uh, in increasing precipitation events, which we've already seen, when it rains more and it rains harder when it does, and the, the uh, cost to, to, to recover from and manage all of that is, is, is a, 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 big, a big issue that, that we really have to be very conscious of. Kind of a, um, a striking story is that, so in just two weeks, uh, Becky and I and, and some other people in the room are going to be going to a scenario planning exercise for St. Croix Nas International Historic Site um, on the St. Croix River and, and there we're dealing with the problem that the island which was um, you, a, uh, a wintering place for the Champlain group, not the Champlain, the original like 1600 Champlain group that, man that mapped this area some of their uh, crew were buried out there. But that island is eroding away. And so we're looking at what happens if that whole island just erodes away. The, the whole park unit, the reason it was created, may not be there anymore because of sea level rise and storm and erosion driven by storms. Um, and so those, that's the kind of level that the Park Service and, and we here are dealing with with, with, uh, with climate change. <laughs> Again. <laughs> I, I, I was going to save this question for later, but that, that last comment made it really clear. Um, with the Leopold report, back when you, you cited before with the, the vignettes of Primitive America, <clears throat> there, was a, there was a clear goal for the Park Service. I mean, and we could make fun of that goal because in some ways it was impossible at the time even. But it did change the way that the Park Service dealt with fire, with wildlife, with a bunch of other things. But there was a goal. It seems like the Park Service, with its new sort of revised approach, has a moving goal. So like with the St. Croix example, um, how do you decide whether to let that go away or to keep it? Do you want to take the St. Croix example? Um, well, I think that we, we, we still hew to the Organic Act. The mission of the Park Service hasn't gone away. We, we, we have a network of preserved areas that are incredibly important to American heritage, to maintaining and preserving biodiversity, and, and I, I don't think that what we, anyone is saying, 
we're not going to keep doing that. Um, but what we do have to do is, is be, um, to be realistic and be, be smart managers. And, and John Jarvis often says that we have to be uh, nimble and flexible and we have to bring you know, be the best science and ingenuity to solving those problems. So one of the things you have to do is, is as I said, you have to rec acknowledge that there is an uncertainty and that things are changing, but that, you, but that doesn't mean that you shouldn't be th planning and adapting and managing for that. And so that these, conversa these really hard conversations are going on everywhere in the Park Service in terms of, as I said, you know, everything from we'll armor the hell out of that coast and we'll save it all to the we, have, we will lose some things and we need to acknowledge that some things will be lost. But how do we still manage and maintain the core of the identity of what parks are? And, and I would agree that it's really, it's really a tough place. And I would say that the Park Service is probably in the middle, in the middle of an identity, not exactly an identity crisis, but, but certainly trying to figure out what we really mean when we say we're preserving for, we're, we're managing for change and we're trying to maintain ecological integrity. You know, what do we really mean by that? And how do you make the decisions on whether you armor the heck out of it or whether you remove the remains before they erode away, or whether you let them erode away, or the road to Scudic, like, do we let it go under? Do we put a bridge in? Do we just end it and just keep it there as a historical thing that ends up underwater? You know, we have to make those decisions and we don't really have the frameworks entirely worked out for how you make those decisions. Right now, the policy advice we're getting from Washington, they're actually increasing the flexibility for us on the ground to, to be able to have, to be able to make uh, kind of decisions that are based on the best available science and, and the reality in terms of our constraints, what our budget constraints are. Um, and, but, but we don't have a lot of precedent for this, um, for how to do this. And so this is a big struggle and this is actually one of the, so as a scientist in the Park Service, this is a really exciting time. It's like, <laughs> it's, like it's kind of sad because we know we're losing things. But it's also an exciting time because the research we're doing here, it gives us the opportunity to do really exciting research that has the ability to set precedent and really, we're gonna be setting this framework that we're gonna be using to help base decisions on for a long time. And so we're doing experiments about like, hey, you know, one of the things we might wanna think about doing at some point is bringing spe helping species migrate, right? Well, is that a good idea? Is that not a good idea? Is it even feasible to do that? So we got to start doing the science now to like, and, and the ethical thinking about what, what do we really want? And so that's where we're at in, in the decision making process. And you know, does that make sense? So it's hard. And so there's not a lot of roadmap and we definitely don't have anything like, we cannot look back. It's, it's hard we're doing a restoration project for instance on Cadillac. But we can't look, we can look back and say what it was 100 years ago, but we know that we, are not, we can't get back there. And so what do we restore it to? How do you restore for the future, right? And so that's where we're going with the science that we're doing right now, and it's, it's an interesting time, but hard. <laughs> this is all too real. <laughs> Does the Park Service collaborate with local communities and business in the area? It, it just seems like it's an island concerned about this. And it, I'm not hearing it in other places and it's just scary. Well, yes, certainly. I mean, we, we recognize that decisions we make at, at, in the park will have effects on neighbors. And as I said, part of the, re, one of the things that we recognize we need to do is we need to communicate. We need to communicate what we're thinking and what we are doing. We need to reach out and pull in partners and make them understand where we're going and, and seek buy-in and seek support. And so um, we do spend a lot of time. It doesn't necessarily always show, you know, in terms of, of uh, 
of where where we're thinking and where we're going. But yes, that's a that's a that's pretty fundamental and pretty key. And I think we need we know we need to do more of it, and we're we're planning to. Any more questions? <laughs> one, one just comment, last comment that I, I wanted to make related to Ken's question is, is inherent in the language even of conservation is this kind of backwards notion of, of preserving and preserving and, and these things. And so that whole language of the whole field, so the whole field of conservation is kind of running up against this. Like how do we even talk about it? Um, so it's a, it's, you know, we're not the only ones, but we're, we're one and, and we're, gonna, we're gonna make a good go of it. And, and try to influence the field from what we do here. Another thought related to the last question is that the Park Service is not alone in their efforts and for their own work, they bring in expertise from outside, university partners, other agency partners, we're all a part of that scenario planning effort, just as one example. There's a lot of other expertise around how our storms are likely to become more intense, how our infrastructure is likely to be challenged. And there are other efforts. The city of Ellsworth has gone through a process of thinking about how storm intensity mm -hmm. is posing a risk to infrastructure and roads. And that there's a potential win-win to make investments before roads wash out in ways that also benefit fish passage and the movement of the roads. And so I, my sense is that the Park Service has potential to be an important leader, but they don't stand alone in these efforts and communities see some of the same challenges once they have opportunity to engage and think about the issues. And that's not always easy. Good point. Uh, so I think we may break here and we can move to an informal conversation. There are some cookies and some coffee outside in the lobby, but please join me in thanking Abe and Becky, not only for, for coming to speak to us tonight and for the conversation, but for grappling with these issues on behalf of all of us and our children and our grandchildren.